Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Self-Publishing Roundtable, episode number 37. Uh, I am joined tonight by the uh, hunky, I've been told, Carl Sinclair. Uh, the, who's eating. Who's eating, yes, which he even does that hunky, too. Uh, John Ward and Trish McCallan. And our very special guest tonight is content editor, or literary editor, or whatever you want to call him, I guess, Harry DeWolf. Harry, so thank you so much for coming on tonight. Appreciate it. Thank you. So, uh, Carl set this up a little bit to, to talk to you because uh, as uh, self-published authors, um, knowing what type of editor to get, knowing if you need an editor, I think is pretty important uh, to our listeners. And heck, we can learn some stuff ourselves. So, Harry, why don't you give us a, just a, a brief introduction of yourself and how you got into this? Sure, I, I, I got into this uh, through uh, my friend Derek Pryor, who is uh, also a self-published author, um, and he had uh, asked me to do some uh, content editing for him, um, and after I did that, uh, he sent a few customers my way. Uh, I'd been working in all kinds of things, but a lot of my work has, in the past has been literary, technical writing, commercial writing, that kind of thing. Um, and uh, and quite a lot of translating, um, and um, so I just started editing for uh, self-published authors, having previously done a little bit of editing uh, for traditional authors. I say a little bit. I had done two books hmm. um, for traditionally published authors, um, and. Uh, I kind of just I got caught up in the whole thing. I think I started at about the right time, and um, sort of I sort of developed the the process that I use for for self-published authors as I went along. Um, the it's it's uh, it's I have to, I have to adapt my process to each author as I go. I have to discover their work as I go and discover how to work for them because. Uh, you're not when you work for a self-publisher. Uh, it's not as if you've got six months to work on a book and a uh, huge budget. Uh, you've got to work to a tight budget, to a tight schedule. Uh, so it is making up. Uh, it's it's making up something that does the most important things that the book needs. Um, and the work that I do. Uh, it's, I guess, easier to say what I don't do. I don't copy edit. I don't line edit. Uh, I only edit the content. Um, and I guess, I guess, if if what I ought not to say is the kind of edit that all writers need is a line edit. Um, that's the one that I think nobody can do without. Um, and after that what you get out of a content edit, what you get out of a developmental edit, um, what you get out of a full literary edit, uh, depends on what you're looking for, depends on your long-term view of what you want to become as an author, uh, and also depends to a certain extent. Uh, I do quite a few uh, edits where it is just a question of either firefighting or tightening things up, tidying things up. Uh, or looking for uh, problems in the story that the author has missed. So it can be very simple, very basic things, uh, right the way through to total restructuring. Okay, so um, when you, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Well, I was gonna, I was gonna, I was just gonna say that my 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 educational background is actually in um, drama theory. Um, which is a very, very good uh, foundation, I think, for uh, uh, for the kind of editing that I do. Uh, because drama theory is all about uh, the process of communicating to uh, an audience's imagination. Um, and that's I, I blogged about that today, so I've got it in my head. But uh, I, 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 I have in my mind, you know, the the the, the, the parallel between the actor-audience relationship and the author-reader relationship, um, uh, which is in itself something that I find fascinating. The the things that that attract me to this work is that I'm fascinated by what makes something a 
story and a book rather than just a sequence or a series of events. And also what happens uh, that makes, uh, that makes a, a book into an experience for a reader. Um, so those are the thoughts that I've got in my head at the moment. You know, I mean, I, if you if you if you let me talk, I can I can just talk and talk and talk for hours. So uh, you know, that, that's a good ask, thing here because we ask, don't have to listen to ask Carl. Ask me questions <laughs> and, Darren, and ask me Darren questions and interrupt was. when my answers are too long. <laughs> John, you you got a question? Go ahead. Um, Harry, there's all kinds of story architecture gurus out there. You got um, Blake Snyder, um, John Truby. Um, the story engineering guy whose name is Larry Brooks. Um, do you have a favorite, um, or do you subscribe to any of their ideologies at all? Or what's your thoughts about uh, that stuff? Note both questions. Um, I think that uh, I understand that people want uh, to be able uh, to look at uh, story creation as if it's engineering. And I think that uh, it's likely to work for some people. But I think there are a great many uh, people for whom it doesn't work. Um, and my personal feeling is that if you discover um, a story writing, a structuring system that suits you, uh, that works for you, uh, then that's great. That's a terrific thing. Uh, I do think that people who do find something like that that works for them should keep looking for others. Um, people ask me that. The, the, the people uh, people ask me the, uh, very similar questions about all the kinds of uh, guides to writing, guides to creativity, uh, whether it's um, uh, whether it's developing a good story or whether it's developing good characters or whether it's developing good uh, descriptive technique, whatever it might be. Uh, my feeling about those is that if you read these books, if you follow those courses, it uh, raises your awareness of your own choices, of your own techniques, um, of your craft, uh, and it provides you with a vocabulary so that you can articulate your thoughts when you are writing. Um, but I don't think any of it makes you a better writer. Uh, I think it helps you to learn faster. But I don't think any of those things are a solution. I think there are they are part of a process of learning and should be treated that way. So as a developmental editor, um, how do you go about making sure that a story is all it can be? It seems like you would want to have the author delineate, okay, these are my goals for this chapter or for this book. And then you evaluate whether those goals are being met, um, whether everything that the author thinks they're communicating is actually being said on the page or not. Um, can you just walk us through um, how, uh, how one of our viewers or listeners can determine whether the developmental editor that they're working with is doing a good job or not. Um, it's funny because the the very last your very the very last part of your question is the part that really can't be answered. Um, in in a sense, you can tell if your developmental uh, editor is doing a good job if ten fifteen years of writing experience down the line, you look back at it and you say what that editor contributed made it into a better book. Uh, because uh, good books are not necessarily successful. Bad books are not necessarily unsuccessful. Um, so wh what I'd rather do, <laughs> rather than say this is how you can tell if what you're getting is good service or not, what I'd rather do is say that uh, there are two approaches to developing a story. Uh, one is when I work with the author before they start writing, uh, which is very much about, as you say, about objectives. Uh, it's about determining things like what the reader's overall experience is going to be. Uh, I like to try to push authors to, to imagine what, uh, how a reader is going to feel 
as he reads the book. Uh, so, you know, is the reader going to get excited? Is the reader going to laugh? Is the reader going to uh, punch the air when you pull off a particular coup de théâtre? Um, so we work through a structure. We develop, um, depending on the type of book, different kinds of outlines. There's a lot. There's quite a lot of back and forth. Uh, what there, what there isn't at that stage, uh, is anything beyond. I think, from my point of view, raising the author's awareness. And I'm going to be kind of evasive and say that how I do that depends a great deal on the personality of the author I've got in front of me, and the kind of book that they want to work on. If we're going to talk about developmental edit on a manuscript that's already completed, then a lot of it is looking at objectives. And some of my authors, uh, I, I, I can think of a couple in particular, uh, I've really, really annoyed them about objectives because uh, objectives can be uh, at the level of the whole book, the reader's experience. They can be at the level of the chapter. So the objective of a, of a chapter needs, it needs to be something you know chapters are about. Uh, getting from one place to another, that can be psychologically, that can be emotionally, that can be physically, that can be a matter of character development. It can be, uh, or it can be a simple matter of uh, of moving your MacGuffin from A to B. Uh, within a chapter, chapters have sections. Each section can be has its subjective. But I go sometimes right the way down to the objectives of a paragraph, the objectives of a sentence, the objective of a clause, the objective of a word. Uh, I've got a blog post in preparation uh, which is about the objectives of words uh, and all about uh, why it's not a good idea to show off the broadness of your vocabulary. Uh, the objectives of individual words is about uh, drawing the reader's attention when you want to draw the reader's attention and going unnoticed when you don't want to be noticed. Uh, and if you're going to get terribly psychological about it, sometimes you know, you, you've know you got a choice between a couple of words uh, and one of them is going to have a, a delayed effect. Uh, I've, I, I've, I work with a, with a writer, I won't say who it is because it'll spoil the effect of his books, but who... <laughs> Uh, who uses repetition of words that are slightly out of place. So he'll use the word the first time and you just think, that's a bit strange, why did he pick that word rather than another one? Or, uh, or even you might think to yourself, did he mean a slightly different word? And, and then further down the line, maybe a couple of chapters later, the same word will come in again. And then maybe a chapter later, it'll come in again. Um, and that is the process of conscious selection uh, for the purpose of fulfilling an objective. Uh, so that's the, the word I've, I've latched onto there in your question is objective. Objectives are of enormous importance uh, if you are going to take uh, a highly conscious approach to your creative process. Um, Harry, looking back at the manuscripts you have done the editing on, what would you say is um, probably the most common mistake you see authors making? Um, I know I ought to say uh, not using an editor, but <laughs> <laughs> the most common mistake that I see authors making, okay, uh, so the most common mistake that I see new authors making uh, is taking uh, too much pleasure in uh, language uh, and not enough pleasure in telling the story. Um, the thing is that I can... Um, there are a lot of common problems. I think that they, at their root, they all have the same thing, which is that when writers that are at the beginning of their career, at the beginning of their experience, they are unconscious of the choices they make when they're writing. They write unconsciously, and that's everything from 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 diction, so from choices of words to turn of phrase, to uh, to the selection of imagery, to 
the way that they build and construct char and develop characters that uh, that to begin with what what writers do is they follow their instincts they do what sounds right they do what flows freely and so on um, but by working unconsciously um, for instance one of the books that I edited last year uh, I started pointing out to the writer every time that he used a cliche and at the end of uh, one chapter there were 200 highlights uh, and a significant number of them were in fact repetitions of the same thing and until I started doing that this particular writer didn't know that he was using even that he was using metaphors um, because it was just that that actually is how he speaks and since I started pointing it out to him he is aware of it now and is making those choices consciously or much of the time is making those choices consciously I'm going to say because uh, uh, it's an ongoing process raising your consciousness of the choices you make as you write uh, is an ongoing process and it takes a minimum of ten novels before you start really being conscious of everything that you're doing um, and then inevitably you start experimenting and adding new stuff and discovering new things that you're not conscious of um, so yeah there is there are so many things that that I could say are the main problem but everything is just about consciousness of, of what you're doing so oh, go ahead John. Is that is that is that a, a satisfactory or yeah. an extremely evasive answer <laughs> No, I think that it, you kind of got down to the root of it. I was just wondering if you were seeing more um, like lack of characterization. I do a lot of judging for um, contests with authors and I would say that the, the biggest mistakes I see is usually a lack of characterization, like a very shallow one-dimensional characterization um, and a lot of people showing that aren't really telling. I mean, they're telling without really showing. They're telling everything that happens instead of showing it as it unfolds. I'm. I. 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 I you see, I don't get hung up on the showing and telling thing because um, uh, I think that each has its place. Uh, it's just that when somebody shows when they could be telling, we don't generally notice it. Whereas if they tell when they should be showing we do and that's what it makes it look as if one is worse than the other when it comes to the characterization I mean I'm working with a new author that, that is, uh, I hope I'm working with him he hasn't uh, he hasn't confirmed yet um, and I've, uh, I've I've looked at a long uh, sample of his work and one of the things that's very clear to me is that uh, his characterization is extremely deep uh, there's a great deal of depth of characterization in there uh, and that's because chatting to him, uh, that's what he cares about. He actually he cares about an individual character's emotional journey. And as a result of that, uh, the part of his uh, imaginative process that is the most detailed is the characterization. Um, having said that, yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's a that's a common uh, that's a common problem. Um, but I think um, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm I'm just thinking back through some recent manuscripts, and I f and it, it does seem to depend on where the writer's priorities are. Uh, I mean, I worked with a guy, Jeff Latimer. Jeff wanted to write a book that gave the same kind of reader experience as Da Vinci Code but he was convinced that he could that Jeff was convinced that he could actually do proper uh, deep uh, detailed characters which is true uh, he can and that was what he wanted he that was it was like that was his frustration uh, with Dan Brown and his solution was to write the kind of book that he thought it ought to have been um, 
So, uh, and now I'm thinking about some short stories that I worked on for competitions. Um, the shorter form is very, very difficult to do characters that are not either uh, that are not either obvious stereotypes uh, or that are not one-dimensional in the short form, but it can be done. What level um, would you say most of the authors that come to you are, though? I'm, I'm guessing that if you're looking for a developmental editor that you've probably been writing at least for a little while. So have most of your authors been, you know, writing for long enough to at least know some of the nuts and bolts of writing? Um, some are and some are not. Uh, I, uh, I mean, a, a very small number of my of, of my clients are people who uh, need nothing more than a sanity check from me, um, and I like doing those because I can read them quickly and I don't have to do uh, I don't have to spend in enormous amounts of time uh, writing detailed explanations of what's wrong. Um, but I have. I, I, I have people that I work with who have no idea at all um, about the nuts and bolts. But, and one of them said to me, I mean, one of the very, very common remark actually is they say to me, I want to know if my work sucks. Uh, and the reason why they want to know that is that they think that if, 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 if the, um, if the, if the, the much venerated uh, content editor tells them that their work sucks, then that means they can never become an author. And I, I only have one way of telling whether or not someone has the potential to become uh, a competent author. Uh, and that one way is can they write a complete manuscript? Because my belief is that anyone who can actually finish a book has what it takes to learn to become a writer. That doesn't mean that they'll ever necessarily become brilliant, that they'll necessarily master the craft, that they'll necessarily be uh, incredibly creative or original. But if you can write a whole book, you can learn the basics of the craft, you can learn some advanced techniques, and the more complete books you can complete, the more you can learn. And so anyone who comes to me and says, I've got a complete manuscript, it's 80,000, 100,000 words long, uh, what I say to them is, well, if you're prepared to do the work, um, then I can help you to learn uh, to be a better writer. Um, and the people who are in it for the long haul, uh, they become better writers. My hope and my aim is that by working with them, they will get better faster. Um, uh, my hope is that they don't all end up becoming what I think makes a good writer, but become what they think makes a good writer. So that leads me into a question. And so, how much do you recommend of, of pre planning, outlining per se, that sort of stuff? Or would you rather they come to you with a full manuscript and then maybe go back? How, what's what's your outtake on that? Um, I like to do I, I like to do kind of what I call a company development with authors who've already completed uh, a book or two or three or four, <laughs> uh, at least one, but preferably more. Um, I don't. With with a with an author who's never actually completed a manuscript, I'd rather say to them, write your first manuscript so that we both know that you can do it. Because it is completing the book that is the the difficult thing when you write the first time. And anyone who can complete it, uh, you know, that we we can then uh, move on. Um, I try not to be too hardline about that, but it's proved to be a good principle to work by. Um, when it comes to planning, I do. I mean, I do. I do have. I do get authors who say to me, "Oh, I don't like to do any planning at all." Um, uh, you know, there there is this. Um, I can't remember what the expression that is that they commonly use is, but there are planners and something else. Pan pantsers. 
That's it. Fine. There we go. <laughs> and I, I, what I, when people say to me, I'm a pan, what I say to them is, no, you're not. You're an unconscious planner. Because <laughs> if you don't plan at all, you will not write a story. But it is possible to know stories well enough to be able to write a story with only a vague idea of where it's going to go and what it's going to do. But you will always begin with an idea, you'll begin with an idea of what kind of story it is, and you might, when you get like a fifth of the way through, change or evolve or adapt your idea of what the story is going to become, of what shape it's going to be. Um, but in principle, you're, what you're still doing is you are still planning, you're still structuring, just not consciously, you're not, perhaps not writing it down, uh, or as I do, uh, drawing, uh, drawing pictures and shapes and putting, putting plot milestones on them and then sticking them on the wall and then tearing them down again and tearing them up. Uh, <laughs> Now, do you feel that um, uh, that it depends on the genre you're working for, for the developmental edit you're getting? Like, do you work within specific genres, or are you pretty much across all the genres for your editing? Just I'd like to say that I'm genres. Um, sorry, was someone else? Carl? I think my... I think uh, you lagged for me, but I was just going to say, in addition to Trisha's question, Darren also wanted to add to that. Uh, Darren Wearmouth asked a question in the comments saying, uh, uh, talking about certain genres, is there anything that you won't edit on principle? So just in addition to what Trisha asked about genres. Not in genres, no. Um, there is, uh, There are some kinds of content uh, that, 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 uh, that make me uncomfortable. Um, but so far I've not had to, oh no, I tell a lie, I have had to turn something down because I didn't want to have to work on it. Um, um, Harry, can I ask, um, how did Wade take that when you turned him down? <laughs> I, was this I, was, I was pretty sad, this actually. Dinosaur uh, erotica. Uh, this yeah. was the dinosaur erotica book, yes, it probably. Yes, it was, yes. Um, Sorry, but I, did, I, did, I, I did have Carl signed up for the cover, though, so I was really disappointed for that. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> right, now we, we stop interrupting the man that's smarter than all of us. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Carry on, Harry. Um, so what you were saying about... Just to go back to Trisha's original question. Um, there are some genres that definitely benefit from a really careful, structured story development before you start writing. Uh, this is absolutely true of thrillers, mysteries, uh, crime, uh, crime books of all kinds. Um, particularly if you're, you know, if you're, if you're interested in uh, the kind of plot that has a, a gradual or a steady revelation. Um, it's good to go for something quite well structured, but a lot of the if a lot of the time, even if you do that, uh, great ideas will come to you as you go. Um, I I sometimes complain at, uh, at writers for what I call plot opportunism. Uh, plot opportunism opportunism is only a problem if the reader can tell that that's what's happened. Plot opportunism is when um, as you are writing, you think to yourself, now this thing that happened a little bit earlier on, if I reinterpret that as something else, then that'll give me a twist right now. And so you change that. You, you Effectively, you add something new and pretend it was there all along. Uh, and if it shows, it's a problem. But if it doesn't show, if, or if you go back and you change a few other things earlier on, so that it works, then like it's terrific. It's a great or way. Of, like and for thrillers that have twists in them, generally that's the the best way to discover them. Is you is you you've written up to a certain point, and then you stop and you think about it, and you say maybe I you know if I look at this another way, uh, then actually, uh, in, actually he's a he's a woman all along. <laughs> 
Carl's story. So it's, like a, it's like a lack of foreshadowing um, to those kind yeah. of things. Is that what you're yeah, I mean, uh, foreshadowing is, a, is, is perhaps a strong word, but yeah, if it's, it can be obvious. I mean, maybe it's more obvious to me uh, than, it, than it might be to the average reader, if, if there is an average reader. However, readers who read in only one genre will, will always spot if you've had a new idea halfway through and changed the direction of the book. They'll always see it. I'm, um, I'm quite a big fan of Brandon Sanderson, and he does Creative Friday lectures um, for a university, and he talks a lot about basically what you're talking about. As he writes his epic fantasies, he comes up with new ideas and uh, reinventing things that have already happened and turning them into twists or expanding on what he was writing. But he then spends at least one full draft, sometimes two, going back and then adding in layers to make all of that make sense that he, you know, yeah. go back from the yeah. beginning and add it in. So it's pretty much what you're talking about, right? Just yeah, making much, sure yeah. that you cover the, the fact that you're making shit up as you go along or adding any extra stuff. Not, not, you, not, you're not covering it. You're, you're, you're exploiting it. Yeah. Okay, so this actually brings us um, to another question, just kind of expanding on this. So if you're working on a multi-book series, um, have you ever um, helped an author, like, outline an entire series at once? Um, outline, yes. Uh, I tend to, I, I work on a principle that, uh, that the level of detail in the outline should decrease uh, as an inverse exponent as you go through the series, uh, because because of the the creative process in writing is one where you keep inspiring yourself, and if you've worked out the whole of the arc of your series and everything that's going to happen in each of the, let's be modest and say five books, I know there are some much much longer series than that. Um, but I, I, I'm able to be patient with a series that has five books in it. Um, that, in fact, when you're writing the first book in the series, that the amount of detail that you get in the final one, that you've, that you've got in your plans for the final one, is about 1% of all of the planning that you've done. Um, so you should have a, a pretty strong idea of what happens in the second book when you're writing the first one. Um, and then, let's say books three, four, and five, uh, there are some important details of the arc, and you know approximately where they're placed across them. And you've got a good idea of why it's divided into five books. Because this is the biggest problem that I find with series in general, is that the reason why they've been divided up is because they're really long. And my feeling is, uh, okay, you can serialize it, in which case it's one book which has been broken up into chunks. But if it is a series of several books, there has to be a story-based reason for why they are separate books. Um, what's... Uh, I mean, I, well, okay, so take the, take the best-known example of all, The Lord of the Rings. Uh, which is arguably six books. Mm -hmm. um, so it's the, the, the three volumes, each of which is divided into two, and there are specific structural reasons as to why the divisions are where they are. Uh, it, all, it has to do with the shape of the plot, and within each book, uh, there is a complete story. Uh, that's ideally what should happen. Uh, I feel like there should be more conscious choice between uh, choice in deciding where the books end. But in terms of planning them, uh, it is uh, it's better for your what I call creative sanity if you don't plan too far ahead, uh, because your creative sanity starts to suffer when you're halfway through the third book, and you know because you planned it before you wrote the first one uh, that the hero has to rescue the girl at this point and then in the following chapter he loses her again but by now your 
really, really bored with both the hero and the girl, and you want something much more interesting to happen. Uh, and you need to be able to. So it's a, it's a question of you plan, you write, you replan, you write the next book, you replan, you write the next book, uh, so that you can keep yourself uh, open to create and invent and retcon furiously. Okay. okay. Uh, I, I, got, I got a quick question. Oh, sorry, John. I keep we get a little lag going on here. Can I go on one, John, and then I'll go yeah, you? Go ahead. Sure. Right. Okay, so you kind of touched on this a little bit, Harry, but um, one of the things that was really interesting to me about the, the, besides all the great stuff you already talked about, which is, I'm like, I'd send the comments, I'm mesmerized, but I want to know what it's really like to work with a content editor um, and what I would expect as a writer if I hired you or another content editor. Um, I, I know with like a line editor, I know what I'm getting for sure, right? I mean, it's really specific, and it seems like, at least a little bit I've heard, that there's a lot of different ways to go about this. So do you charge via time? Do you do you schedule so many sessions of feedback? That sort of thing. So uh, I estimate the amount of time that I'm going to need to read, to highlight everything that I think needs to be addressed, uh, and to uh, write up my notes uh, because I I put notes and highlights and comments in the text uh, and I also uh, write up uh, a separate kind of a report if you like it's kind of a critical report uh, which can be what for a hundred thousand word book generally speaking it's somewhere around well, somewhere between eight and twenty-five pages uh, of uh, of report. Um, much of that is is. No, well, it depends. Actually, it depends completely on uh, on the book. The kind of thing that I will do and the kind of analysis I will do depends on the book. Uh, but before I start, I will have a live chat with the author. Um, I usually use Skype, but uh, since I've just been taught to use uh, Google Hangouts, I may well <laughs> be using that a little bit more in the future. Um, but but it is, for me, it's absolutely to essential to be able to talk to the author before I start. Um, uh, it's partly it's for me to get an idea of what I'm going to be able, got, what I'm going to need to do. It's also very important for me to hear the author speaking. And so I'll, I'll, I'll ask all sorts of questions which will just get you to talk. So I can listen to your voice. I can, uh, so I can listen to uh, your diction. I can listen to the way that you structure your thoughts. Um, because that will tell me whether when I'm reading, I see like a turn of phrase and I think this is a little bit jarring here. But if I've heard you speaking, I can actually tell if it's something that's natural for you or if it's a mistake or if you're in a rush or if you're... You were particularly stressed when you were writing, or you were distracted, like your dog was vomiting on your shoes as you wrote the French <laughs> essay. Uh, that's really important to me, but it also allows me to manage the writer's expectations as well, which I think is absolutely essential. You need to know what I'm going to do, or what I hope or expect I'm going to do for you. Um, and that depends on what your objectives are for the book, what your objectives are for your future as a writer. I worked last year with um, uh, I, with someone who uh, writing a book was kind of a bucket list thing. Uh, so I learned the expression bucket list by working with this person. Um, uh, so she had written her book, and she basically just wanted it to be as good as she was able to make it, so she could say to herself, I've done it, I've written my book, I can move on. Um, so your, your, your personal objectives matter a great deal to me. People who come to me and say, look, I've written a series of short stories, and I just don't feel my writing is good enough, can you teach me to be better? Then, yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, so what happens next? I do my reading. I do my highlights, uh, I identify issues, I identify problems, I identify um, 
techniques you use, I identify habits that you have, uh, I write up my report, I send a huge chunk of stuff back to you. I also, my, my customers also benefit from uh, a, uh, a, I think it's now 30 or 35 page um, uh, sort of, I'm not sure exactly what to call it, it's kind of a, it's kind of a manual for working with me. Uh, which is divided into sections which are all specific issues that have arisen on previous manuscripts that I think it's worth authors generally being aware of. Um, and uh, so I send that over as well. And you get to read all of the stuff, and then we talk again. You should now, record that in your voice, Harry, because uh, that would be a number one best-selling audio book. You could make some <laughs> extra money on the side. <laughs> Maybe. Um, John, uh, you, got, you got a question, John? Uh, yeah, so, sorry. I, just uh, this. Okay, you, you just to answer your question fully. You ask what I bill for and what I don't bill for. Oh yes. And what I bill for is my analysis. What I do not bill for is any discussion that's needed of my analysis. So. If we need to talk, we talk, and uh, that's not billed for, uh, because uh, it's important for me to know that I have communicated to you, um, and that you've understood, and that you know what to do with all of the information that I've given you. Uh, you know, some for some authors it can be pretty overwhelming. If you send me a, uh, you know, a, you send me a seventy thousand word manuscript and it comes back with eight hundred highlights in it, um, <laughs> it can be quite overwhelming. And and then you know, then there's a twenty five page document next to it saying these are all of the high level things that you need to deal with in the structure, and these are the these are the bad habits you've got. Uh, these are the Somebody recently had a list of words that I told them you've got to eliminate these words from the manuscript, um, and uh, that was someone who needed to. It's not so much simplify their language as just be aware of where they were using exotic things unnecessarily. Um, uh, I worked with someone recently. I discovered that his book is a lot of fun, but uh, he. Um, had kind of a blind spot for writing action sequences. And so I said to him, well, look, pick an action sequence, rewrite it, send it to me. I'll edit it again, send it back. To, and and we, def we went through that process, therefore, twice on a particular, well, there's just this particular action sequence. Because I felt it was important to raise his awareness of what was going wrong with his action sequences. Um, which we kind of concluded was that he was anxious to make sure that the reader was aware of everything that was happening to all of the characters. Uh, and, uh, you know, if you're in a car chase or a shootout, that's kind of tricky. Um, and also not really very interesting for the reader. Um, so uh, I, I try to kind of reassure myself that, 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 uh, that you've got out of the process what you need to get out of it, and your book has got out of it what it needs to get out of it. Because I kind of, sometimes I feel like I'm advocating for the story. So it's like me and the story on one side and the author on the other. Um, sometimes I'm advocating for the characters. I, this, hap this happens more often than you'd think, actually, is authors who are wrong about their own characters. I had an author who, told, who kept saying in the book that a particular character was terribly charismatic, but he really wasn't. Um, he was compelling, but not charismatic. Um, uh, you know, authors who are uh, obviously, in their own imagination, find a particular ca character terribly attractive, but actually the way that they've written that person, that personality, is perhaps revealing something a bit... Uh, uh, a bit strange about the, the author's personal tastes, <laughs> uh, and so sometimes authors, you know, they, they, I need to tell them, and I need them to understand. I need to know that they've understood uh, this character. You've written them in a way that is extremely believable, but you're not fully aware of what you've done. 
Um, and I find if you, you have to have face-to-face -face conversation to be able to get some of these ideas across, and to be able to to, to be able to teach some of these techniques as well. Hmm. Very interesting. Go ahead, John. What I can't comment on is how other content editors work. Okay. Um, beyond saying that I believe that a content editor would have to be uh, deliberately trying to cheat you in order to do to do harm to your learning process and your development. Because working with a content editor will force you to think about how you create and how you write. Uh, even if you know, even if in the end you decide, you know, the the the, the big risk for a content editor is that uh, because the big risk for it, what's the big risk for a copy editor? Well, it's that he sends back a manuscript that's still got loads of mistakes in it. Uh, and that's going to damage his reputation, but a copy editor can improve his attention to detail. For a content editor, the big risk is that the author is not satisfied with your work. They feel that the book has not got significantly better. Now, what will, the, what will the author do? They'll go to another content editor, and a content editor, being conscientious, will say to themselves, well, the author has sent me this manuscript. They must feel that it needs to be improved. So I'm going to look for what needs to be improved in it. Uh, and so I'll send it back to them, and they'll, say, then they'll, they'll then say to me, well, there's, you've told me loads of things that the previous content editor I went to didn't spot. Um, uh, the, the truth is, though, they could take their manuscript then to somebody else, and that conscientious content editor will also find more things to be improved, and so on ad infinitum. Uh, yeah. Harry, I want to ask you I'm about stop the there because otherwise I'm sorry, I, was, I interrupted myself because I just saw a very interesting tangent, but I thought I'd let you ask a question. <laughs> I want to ask you about the different types of content editing. So far, we've um, been discussing full content editing, but on your website, you also offer something called LitCrit. Um, can you explain what that is and um, tell us? Yeah, about it? Lit, um, is that, that's quite a. It's quite an old-fashioned approach, um, but it is. Uh, it's. I mean, I, I was about to say it's literally. It's literally a literary criticism. What it is is an appraisal of the uh, of, I suppose you could say it's an appraisal of the author's technique of the structure of the story and the success of the author's technique and the structure of the story much in the way that mid 20th century literary criticism was conducted um, it is something which uh, some authors have found uh, immensely valuable I tend to think, though, that if you, it's it's more useful if you've already got quite a lot of practice as a writer. Um, uh, what it, uh, but it's not about whether or not a book is good or bad, uh, and it's not about how to improve the book. It's about describing how the book works. Um, so, well, let's suppose it's a thriller, then I will uh, do an analysis of how the author builds tension and excitement, how they, uh, the techniques that they use to reveal details of the plot. Um, so it's, it's about how. It's not, therefore, um, it's not qualitative. It's about methodology and technique and structure. What's some of the type of uh, feedback you would give to an author um, who um, hired you to do a lit crit? And you also do short stories for this as well, right? Yeah, I, I mean, uh, increasingly, I'm uh, I'm actually adapting. Uh, the work that I do uh, specifically to the needs of the story and to the author's objectives. Uh, so that kind of pure lit crit is something that I that I haven't 
done very much of, I did a couple of them last year. I, it's not something that is often asked of me. It's much more likely, in fact, that, uh, that, that I'll get an author who say to, who will say to me, if, if I'm doing something that's quite, that's quite a light service, an author will say to me, oh, I'm trying a new direction here. Can you take a look at this and tell me what you think? And how much will you charge me for that? Um, uh, and so basically for that, I kind of will, will depending on the length of the book, work out a, a reading fee that pays for my time. Um, uh, and uh, uh, either I'll we'll then simply schedule a conversation and discuss the book, uh, or I'll write a, a briefer report and analysis. Um, what I try to do, in all cases, what I try to do is to satisfy the two things. One, what the author tells me they want, and two, what the story tells me that it needs. Um, I'm not sure if that answers your question. Can you give me an example of some piece of feedback, feedback that you would give to somebody who's asked for a lit crit compared to the in-depth reporting that you do with a full um, content edit? Um, yeah, let me um, let's see if I can find one. Because, I, as I said, it's the liquid is not so much feedback as um, as dry analysis. Okay. Um, so, what I don't do with the liquid is tell the author what I think they should do. I tell the author what they have done. Gotcha. Okay, that makes sense. Harry, I have an, another question from the live comments, and it's kind of off topic, but Darren Wearmouth wants to know why you're torturing a panda with weights behind you. A little <laughs> panda behind you. Um, hang on a moment. Okay. Now, that is a wooden toy that was bought for me in the Welsh village of Fishguard, when I was younger than 10, I cannot tell you how old I was, and it has followed me around ever since. Uh, it, and what, what happens is you, you pull on the two little rods, and it climbs up the string. Well, since Darren oh, we is um, making fun hopefully of... Da yeah, I, hopefully I, that answers your question, Darren. How do you see the live comments? Um, I will give you the post in the chat up here. Um, it's on the website, basically. Oh, okay. Um, they're all chatting about how amazing you are, how many people are going to hire you, um, and comparing you to being better than people like Chuck Norris and all sorts of stuff. So you should be very happy. <laughs> You've become, I'm an, internet, you've become an internet sensation. I'm better. I'm better at better than Chuck Norris at content editing. Well, it's a big Aaron. call. Chuck Norris is pretty amazing. So. Since Darren is making fine. fun of your beloved childhood toys, um, do you have any stories you want to tell us about him while you were doing editing for him? Yeah. Yeah. How was Darren working working with him? There you go. How was working with Darren? He's a good friend of our show. Yeah. That Darren is. Um, uh, uh, Darren is, is uh, I'm going to say, interesting. Uh, <laughs> no, but I'll tell you why. Okay, it, it's because uh, it's because Darren uh, didn't. I, I think is still kind of getting used to uh, having uh, become an author. Um. You know, it's it's like it's uh, and so there is there's some really nice things about working with Darren, which is that he thinks actually he thinks like a, a businessman. Uh, he 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 thinks in he thinks in 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 strategies and and planning and technique and uh, it's 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 um, it's very refreshing. He's not hung up on. Uh, his extraordinary language skills. He's not hung up on his amazing uh, char character creations. Um, 
he's interested in uh, how can I get people to read my book. Um, yeah. And it, it's it's uh, well, it's nice because it means that uh, I, I don't have to be um, I don't have to hold any punches when I'm when I'm when I'm talking with Darren about his his work. Um, and uh, I should say Darren, Darren and Marcus's work. Um, uh, you'll have to ask Darren why that, why, what the reason for the wicked grin when I said that. Um, <laughs> I will. He's messaging me now. He's, he's, he's like, stop talking about me. Yeah, he's probably calling you a dick. Is what he's probably doing. <laughs> <laughs> I he think everyone calls him that. He wouldn't, use the word, he wouldn't use the word dick because he's worked with Harry. He would have much more high-level <laughs> insult than that. <laughs> oh, dear. You see, this, this, is where, this, is where my, this is where my voice uh, is a disadvantage. Is that you all... Is a, some people assume that the British guy uh, is much, much better more educated, much more well read. You know, people think that I've read far more than they have. And one of the things you get interested in as a content editor is you get interested in readers. And you very soon discover that you're not a reader. There are readers out there and readers are people who are experts at reading. Uh, it's not just a quantity. Reading is a skill. Uh, it's um, it's a whole uh, imaginative process, and readers are way better at it than authors. You, you know, there are authors. You know, critics love to talk about the breadth of an author's imagination, uh, but authors' imagination is nothing compared with readers' imagination. The really good readers, uh, you know, that uh, this is again. This is the blog post I did earlier today, but it's true. Uh, that uh, that the reader can imagine far better than you can describe. Yeah, and that, that's why you shouldn't be showing all the time. There are some things that you can just tell, and the reader will see them. Um, while speaking about your um, blog posts, uh, I was reading some the other day, and. Uh, I commented on Twitter on one in particular that interested me. You had written a blog post about um, essentially why authors shouldn't uh, write internal thoughts as uh, dialogue uh, with italics. You know, basically, if a character, you're in a character's head and you wanted to put forward what it was they were thinking but not use it as dialogue, uh, there's this trend, obviously, and I do it as well a lot. Um, and a lot of the books I read these days deal with it the same way, uh, of having those thoughts put forward in italics. Uh, and your blog post um, told us why we're all wrong. Um, <laughs> did you want to uh, uh, explain uh, a little bit about why you feel that way and, and, and what, it, uh, what authors could do a little bit differently? Uh, so, okay, I, I have to take issue with your t saying I'm telling you you're all wrong. Nothing is wrong if you're no, doing it. For a reason. I'm teasing. I'm teasing. I know, but this is, it, it, for me, this it, it, it is fundamental to my to my uh, to my job, is that nothing an author does is wrong if they're doing it for a reason and they know what that reason is. It may not work, you know. It may not. Uh, it may not uh, have the effect on the reader that you want it to have. But if you have chosen to do it, you're not wrong. Uh, my worry about this whole issue of thought is that uh, because this is the uh, a very popular convention uh, for dealing with character thought right now, uh, readers are being, as a result, deprived of an enormous dimension of characters. It's like there's a whole dimension missing. Which is the dimension of what it what it is to experience thought. Um, if you simply represent what I'm your thoughts as uh, words, 
as if they are a phrase, as if they are something which can be encapsulated in syntax, then you are missing everything else that's involved in thought, everything which uh, everything which um, is uh, provoking you uh, to speak and to act. Uh, and what provokes you to speak and to act, uh, what you what you feel in reaction to uh, to events around you, to what other people say, uh, is a great deal more than just syntax. Uh, thoughts, therefore, obviously carry with them a burden of emotion, but also of memory, of personal history, uh, of motivation, um, of reaction. I already mentioned. Um, and all of those things are reflected not just in what a character says, but in what he does, in what he wants to do but doesn't do, uh, in what he's trying to do, but also in his posture, uh, in his uh, uh, in the, his choice of drink when he gets to the bar, thought. Uh, pervades everything that you do and simply representing it as if it's a line of speech is selling it short and as a, and, and that's why I feel that it's leaving out this huge dimension um, and, uh, and so I, I urge anyone who hasn't already read the blog post to go and read it because I, I think I wrote quite a good example of the difference um, between thought as if it's just speech and representing thought as part of narration I think that thought needs to be narrated, not stated. Um, no, I'm not... Uh, actually, no, I'll tell you what I am saying. When I'm thinking, it's not in words. Uh, and when I'm speaking, there aren't, like, words running on a reel through my head and I'm reading them off. That's not what's going on. Um, the thoughts that are going on uh, are preparation for what I say. But actually, yeah, it's like my mouth is doing the speaking part. My mouth is making the words. Um, the thoughts are not words. Interesting. Very interesting. All right, we're come. We up on a little over an hour, and I. I like our commenters said, we could probably sit and listen to you all night long, Harry, but we want to respect your time and everybody else's. Was there any other I questions? I can't talk all night long. <laughs> <laughs> well, we do run a um, an after party where we invite some of the live viewers in to talk to us and our guests if you wanted to stick around for a little while, uh, yeah, depending I'm... on how late it is for you. It's uh, 3 a.m., uh, so, you know, it's too late to care. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Well, really, okay, so, double yeah. thank you for being on 3 a.m. <laughs> Just before we go off, um, your blog, um, I did post it in the um, on the post. Uh, it's densewords.com. Um, and what's your Twitter handle, Harry, if people want to follow you and find it, out and read dense all of your words. wisdom? It's, it's dense words. So at dense words. Yep. Um, I, I don't. Uh, I don't Twitter very much because I mean, my, you know, my blog posts go up on there, and, and if if somebody argues about one of my blog posts, then I will reply. <laughs> <laughs> I strongly uh, suggest that people do go and read your blog because I found myself down a rabbit hole reading a bunch of your posts the other day. It is a time sink, but at least it's a value time sink. I think so. I, anyway. I, can I add the, the health warning to that, that there are occasionally links to TV tropes in my blog? Well, that uh, makes it even more worthy for people to go over there. Well, it, I'm just saying that's possibly... A, 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 I'm just saying don't follow those. <laughs> <laughs> stay, on, stay on my blog. So yeah, yeah. yeah, you don't want to. You don't want to get stuck on TV tropes. That that site is a real, uh, real time sink. But um, definitely go over and read Harry's blog. Um, if anyone wants to come in for the after party, then uh, make a comment. After party invites. Yeah, uh, we can fit a few people in. Um, 
the show will be up as a audio download and iTunes uh, option within about an hour. That's how fast I am at doing it these days. Um, but we would really appreciate it if people could take the time to leave us a review on iTunes about the show um, or um, go over to the YouTube page itself and give us a like um, and maybe leave a comment there. I know we use the website for our live comments, but um, getting likes and reviews on iTunes and YouTube is going to help us continue to build the show. So that's um, really important. And I wanted to thank Harry very much for his time. He's a very interesting guy um, and very good at his job, and I really appreciate it, Harry. Yes, thank and, you, Harry, very much. And Quite before we go off the air, I wanted to let everybody know we're going to be having Courtney Milan on next week, and we'll be touching on translation. She's in the process of doing a bunch of different translations. So for those of you who are interested in translations, make sure you um, come live next week so you can ask her any questions. One more question before we go off. Um, it's a very important one on topic. Um, Several of the our viewers have asked what type of guitar you have in the background. Ah, uh, that is a Court KX5. So there you go, folks. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, just, just to, 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 so that you know, that is a PV Viper 100. That is my baby. Uh, that's a. Um, that's a fully modelizing 100-watt uh, uh, amplifier. It's awesome. You can content see where all, those, that's where all the money. Yeah, Rockstar, content editor, <laughs> demigod. <laughs> Speaks English and French, Latin. Yeah. <laughs> and he has a British accent. Yeah, so basically he just won the internet. That's right. <laughs> Thanks um, for being All right, here. well... Thanks for Thanks watching, everyone. Thanks, Thanks for your comments. Thanks for watching, everyone. Good night, everybody. Say hi to your mums for me.